Ladies and gentlemen, I'm proud to present my good friend, somebody who I do really consider to be a fantastic friend and as well as a role model that I watch, not only for his books and his insight, but of course, just the things he gets up to in everyday life. Definitely someone to keep watching, just to portray yourself in his limelight or shadow, I think. Author of Fat Loss Happens on Monday and one half of Complete Coaching Mentors, my buddy, Josh Hillis. Josh, take it away, buddy. That was a great intro, man. That, that was awesome. That was like, I, I thought you were going to end it with like, are you ready to rumble? Or like, that was, that was and do you know what the thing is? I make all this up as I go along. James, James and Josh, they like to plan things and plan a script. Yeah. I'm better just making things up as I go. I, I dig it. I dig it. All right. Let's, 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 let's dig in. Okay, today we're going to get into Goldilocks and food habits, which for trainers that are in the gym, right, like most of the time, in, in reality, we might get like five minutes to talk about food habits with our clients at the end of a session or like during the warm up or in between sets or whatever. But we like, like we're not getting like an hour to go over people's food and to dig in on what's going on. 99% of what we do really like, like, especially if you're doing semi private, it really comes down to Goldilocks and the food habits. You're like, you've got five minutes left after, after they're finished or whatever. And you're like, all right, what habit were you working on? Um, how'd it go? What's going well? What'd you learn? Okay, great. What about next week? Here are some options and how much are you going to do? And this is, this is something that, um, that is so hard because the clients are going to fight you on it. And it's, it's, it's everything about getting the habit just right for the client. That's why you call it, that's why you call it Goldilocks. It's just like Goldilocks and three bears where, um, where, you know, it's like this porridge is too hot. This porridge is too cold. This porridge is just right. Uh, we're trying to get the habits just right for the clients, and they almost always want to take on too much. And then the flip side is, I've talked to a lot of trainers that when they first start doing habit coaching, they they really get hooked on the idea of um, uh, like minimum uh, minimum effective dose, and they'll actually push like too far, like make it too easy, and the clients will get bored. And so um, so this that's what this is all about. This is going to be about getting the habits just right for the client's skill level and also their stress level and their schedule and making it fit so that our clients stay in the game, right? And that's kind of like the whole thing. If they can just stay in the freaking game with their food habits, they're going to get all the results they want eventually. We just need to keep them in the game. So Cool. cool. Okay. Well, we as, uh, as we and you discussed earlier regarding your slides, there's loads of them, but <laughs> they don't all apply for what you're going to present to us today. So again, just you just let me know. Go ahead, ahead, backwards. Just let me know which slide yeah, you yeah, want yeah. when we get it right. Let's, let's let's bump one ahead. Okay. I push the button. It's not working. Ah, oh, my computers are in problems. Regular <laughs> listeners will understand the issues I have with my laptop. There we go. Okay. All right. So um, so at the end of a session, we're generally looking at. Like, um, like three different things for coaching. We're looking at creating awareness, which is going to be mostly about open-ended questions and specific positive feedback, which we're not going to get into, into um, a lot today. But just to be thinking about creating awareness for your clients is mostly about asking questions. Like it's, it's way less about you talking and way more about you asking them about what's going on. All right, bump up one forward. And so, um, same thing, like you're going to listen to how last week went and get like a sense of where they're at. If it was hard, if it was easy, like that kind of thing, bump it forward. Um, bump it one more forward. <laughs> Again, we're not cheating you out of anything guys. Just as Josh told me earlier, <laughs> a lot of these don't really apply to what he's presenting this evening. Yeah. Um, so another way to create awareness that's really, really, really easy is just to have them focus on one habit at a time. And there's none of those things where clients constantly fight us on. They're like, they always want to work on two habits or three habits or five habits. So they want to do an elimination diet or they always want to do way more than they can. But if we just focus them on, like if their habit for the week is on, is eating slower, just by virtue of the fact that we narrow them down to that one habit, they'll actually pay attention to how fast or slow they're eating for the week. 
if we give them a habit like planning, all of a sudden they'll, it'll create some awareness around how little they plan. So you could literally pick any habit from my book or Georgie's book, and as long as you give them that one habit for the week, that's a phenomenal way to create awareness, right? So that's that's kind of like the easy, like um, like the the trick way to get them to focus on one thing. Slide. Slide. So um, again, like super, super quick, specific positive feedback, letting them know like a specific thing that they're doing well. Like if you, if you give them some feedback on an action they did well, like my biggest pet peeve in the world is when coaches are like, good job, good job, right? Because like that just like kind of fades away into nothing. It's, al it's almost useless. Sometimes it's worse than useless because um, they'll actually stop believing your feedback. So if you can say, oh man, it's so awesome that you ate slowly at three more meals this week than last week, they're like, yeah. Or if you're like, oh man, it's so awesome that you kept your knees lined with your toes on that squat, they're like, yeah. That's another way of creating awareness. Slide. Habit options. Habit options are gonna be how we set up, um, it's like, the easiest, simplest way to do a, like a guiding style of training, right? So we're always leaning away from directing because directing doesn't work really well with stuff that's outside the gym, which means it doesn't really work very well with food. Directing is telling people what to do. We're always trying to guide. We're trying to create a plan with them. And so the easiest way to have them take, um, like, take like an active role in, the, in their habit plan is just to give them a couple options, right? You give them three different habit options and they get to pick which one they think is going to be the, the next best one. You've already looked at them. You already know that these are three habits that will make a difference for them. It doesn't actually matter which one that they pick. All that matters is that they're working on something to do with their food. So if you give them options, that's a really easy way to do a guiding style of food coaching. Slide. So, and then we get to what we're talking about today, which is Goldilocksing. And like I talked about in the intro, Goldilocksing is where you set people up to win. You're setting them up like it's not this porridge is too hot, it's not this porridge is too cold, it's this porridge is just right. We do the same thing with habits. We don't want this habit to be too easy where they get bored, which is rare, but that does happen. And we don't want it to be too hard, which is what mostly happens. And then they get in this like cycle of failure and then they just kind of tune out working on their food. And they might still come in for their workouts and they're stoked about their workouts, they're getting stronger and they love that, but they're not making progress. They're not making the progress they could in their weight because they're not, they're, they're not engaged with their food habits anymore. So that's what Goldilocksing is about. We get to keep people engaged. The reason that my clients stay in the game for as long as it takes to hit their goals is because is because we get it right every single week, and so um, you know some weeks they might lose a half pound, some weeks they might lose a pound, some weeks they don't lose a pound, but um, but they stay in the game and they keep losing until they hit their goals, and um, that's that's uh, that's what we're going to dig into. So let's 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 get into it. Slide. Boom. All right. So there's two ways to Goldilocks a habit. There's scale and there's frequency. So scale is how hard it is, right? And, the, and so if, you're, if you've got a client that's working on a habit like, so, so if, if you take all of Georgie's hunger habits, they're pretty freaking hard for people at first, right? If someone's working on something like, like I'm going to wait 30 to 60 minutes before eat, of, I'm, if, I'm, her hunger mastery habit, I'm going to wait 30 to 60 minutes of being hungry before I eat. That's a really hard habit for people especially if they're like kind of in the habit of never being hungry, right? But it's super useful because if they're in the habit of never being hungry, then they're probably not losing weight. So, but it's one of those things where 30 minutes can be like a huge amount of time to wait. So one of the ways we Goldilocks it is we can have a client just say like, okay, I'm going to wait five minutes of being hungry before I eat a meal. Super, like that's super doable. It's not super scary. It has them getting meaningful practice. That might be the first time they've ever been hungry in years, honestly, some, some of the clients we get. And so like, if they're waiting five minutes of being hungry, it, that, like, that could be a game changer. And then if they rock that, they can bump it up to 10 minutes of being hungry the next time. We can do it the same thing with eating slowly. 
eating a 20 minute meal can be super, super hard for someone that's used to eating fast. We might start them at five minutes or 10 minutes or eight minutes or whatever. And, um, and so we do that with all of them. We can do that with a protein habit where um, one client might track the, the number of grams of protein that they're, that they're getting in a day and they might start off with 50 grams of protein and work up to 60 or, um, or, or like, like, like that. That's, that's Goldilocks in scale. Frequency is the most obvious one, which is we Goldilocks how many meals. And so most of the time clients are going to be like, oh, I'm going to take on dinners or I'm going to take on lunches during the week or I'm going to take on lunches and dinners during the week, or I'm going to do 10 meals or whatever. So those are, those are the two ways that we adjust difficulty. And you'll, you'll notice that some habits lend themselves more towards Goldilocks and frequency and others, Goldilocks, uh, others lend themselves more towards Goldilocks and scale. Or you may notice that some clients kind of lean towards Goldilocks and frequency and some of the clients lean towards Goldilocks and scale. It doesn't matter. These are just the two things to consider when you're setting up a habit so that it works for a client. Slide. So um, let's, ooh, let's have some fun. You want to have some fun? This is going to be great. Okay. Let's have some fun. So, so we've, got, we've got a bunch of people on the webinar. Um, let's have some people like kind of shout out. How could a client scale? I already did eating slowly and I already did eating protein meal. Oh, okay. So um, everybody just type in, like, how could a client Goldilocks, um, how, how could a client scale food journaling? And what are some options for frequency for food journaling? Go ahead and type it in. Type it in, and uh, as we're waiting, we'll have some music. Do, 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 do. It's like elevator music. Do, 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 do. <laughs> that was pretty good. I actually thought you were playing. Were you playing something, or were you mouthing that? No, no, I was mouthing that. That's pretty good. Beatboxing. Okay, so no one is typing anything in. There. Uh, um, just, I'll tell you what, some people may be thinking, just ask the question again, just in case somebody wants to a refresh. Ah, here we go. So. Holly has got one scale. Write down yeah. what's good, not the amounts. Right, right, write down what foods, not the ah, amounts. Ah, foods. Sorry, so there you go. Write down what foods, not the amounts. Yeah. Um, Lorraine's got food journal, one meal a day. Yeah. So there's two great examples. Holly did a really good example of, of a way to scale food journaling. And, and a lot of people don't necessarily think about like, how many different ways you could scale that. Like if someone's writing down what to eat, that's drastically different from them entering in all the calories in my fitness pal, right? Those are very different scales. If someone's, um, if someone's not even comfortable with that, we can even have them take pictures of the meals with their phone. That's another way to scale it, right? Um, and so those are all different ways. And the, the game we're playing is I just want my clients to, to be aware of what they eat. I don't care if they take a picture, if they write it down, or if they enter it in my fitness pal. Um, they're, they're going to self-select by level, you know, if I, if I get a personal trainer for a client, they're going to absolutely go to my fitness pal and they're going to weigh and measure to the gram because it's fun for them. If I've got a client that's like 60 pounds overweight, they're probably going to take pictures with their phone. Cause even that's a little bit threatening, right? So people get to self-select for scale. And then what Lorraine said about, um, about like journaling one meal a day is awesome. That's super awesome. A lot of times a client might say, you know, I've got breakfast and lunch kind of okay, but dinner's a mess. I'm going to start by just journaling dinner. That's rad. That's super rad. I've even had clients say like, you know what, during the week's kind of okay, but the weekend is a mess. I'm going to start journaling the weekend or vice versa where the clients are like, the, weekend, the week is kind of okay and the weekend's a mess, so I'm going to start journaling the week, right? Um, Any way that we get them doing more than they're, they've done in the past is awesome. Um, let's take a look at planning my meals. What are, what are some different ways that people could scale planning their meals? This, this one, this one's a little tricky. This one's, uh, there, there's a lot of things people don't necessarily think about, but if, if anyone wants to type in, what's a way someone could scale planning their meals, making it easier or harder? <clears throat> okay. So variety. So 
thinking about the easier way for you to get your client to scale easier for them to plan their meals. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'll, I'll jump in on this one. Oh, planning two days at a time. That is so great. That is so freaking great. I, I love that you said that. Planning only breakfast the day ahead. Awesome. Doing food prep. Oh, man, you guys are awesome. Now, now they're flooded in. Oh, my God. Everyone's got it now. Yeah. So what's cool, if, if you guys can – I'll read them just in case. I don't know if these all show up on the video or not. But Holly says make breakfast options the night before. So you take a look at that. The night before, they're planning the very next meal. Awesome. Bridget says doing, doing food prep in advance. Awesome way to plan ahead of time. Thomas. Um, Plan only breakfast the day ahead. Also, that's that's a popular one. <laughs> um, plan breakfast for the week, right? So planning the entire week at one time. Lee says planning two days at a time. And um, and then Jerry also said plan the day or the night before. These are all awesome. They're so awesome. And it goes to show like you could plan for the next day or the night before. You could plan two days at a time. You could plan a week at a time. I've even had clients scale it all the way back to I'm going to plan the meal five minutes before I eat it. And that, that might seem like, like kind of um, like the lowest level, but it actually totally works, right? Instead of walking into Chipotle and getting whatever they normally get, they, they think like, okay, what could I get there that would actually fit, you know, what, whatever my, my plan that I've, I've created for myself, or however I'm portioning or, or like that. Um, or they think through like, okay, I brought this with me, but what are the right portions? Or, or hey, wait, I realized that, like, I realized at the last minute, like, this doesn't have any protein. What could I, could I add an egg really quick or something like that? Oh, I, I love it. Is, is that Elena? Elena, that's, that's a cool name. Um, says, make a double meal for dinner, save the leftovers for the next day. Awesome. That's like a genius way to plan for the next day. So you guys all completely rock scale. That's super, super, super good. Um, uh, fall asleep routine is another one that's really hard to scale, but uh, but a sleep routine could be something like could be something as simple as I'm going to turn screens off at ten o'clock, or it could be where I've had some plans that are like I'm going to turn screens off and I'm going to drink some chamomile tea and I'm going to read ten minutes of fiction or whatever. So that's how you could scale that. Um, and then frequency for all these things you know, is usually like, I will eat slowly for dinners, I will eat slowly for meals that I'm not at work, I will eat slowly like that. Um, I'll eat protein at meals, people usually just do like, I'm gonna do 10 meals this week, or I'll do dinners or lunch. Um, frequency is usually a pretty easy one for people to get. Scaling is usually the hard one, so I'm glad we spent a little time on that and you guys thought that through. All right, slide. Slide. <clears throat> and so this is kind of like what I was talking about before was that um, the, the big issue with Goldilocksing isn't usually people taking on too little. It's almost always them taking on too much and failing and then disengaging from working on food habits. But that being said, I, I know a lot of trainers that are really about like, – like the trainers that we hang out with are like smart and cool and have empathy and are into minimum effective dose. And um, I, I have seen some trainers like that that are um, trying to be too reasonable and giving clients too little, and the clients are actually um, like, "You're an idiot! Like this isn't like this is completely worthless." So, um, so we do want to get it where it's a little bit of a stretch, but where people can still win. So that's what we're going to talk about. That's what we're going to get into right now. All right, slide. slide. <laughs> Um, so, uh, so I look at it like the problems with you and the problems with the client, right? So the problems that trainers make are they give two clients too much scalar frequency or they give them more than one habit at a time. I see trainers do this all the time. They give them like three habits and they're like, I'm just giving them three habits to start, right? Like, well, you know, like here's, here's the thing. Precision Nutrition says that if a, if a client takes on one habit at a time, they've got an 80% chance of success. If they take on two habits at a time, they've got a 20% uh, – sorry, 30% chance of success. And if they take on three or more habits at a time, they've got a 0% chance of success. So um, 
I've been trying to figure out where they got those percentages. Um, and I've even asked my friend Steve, who's kind of like the research nerd, and he's like, I can't find an exact study. He's like, but it's not wrong. He's like, he's like, I'm sure it's true. Um, so just be thinking about that when your client wants to take on three habits, or when you're tempted to give clients like two or three habits, you're you're dooming them to fail. It's not if, it's when. And so if you're giving someone two habits at a time, it's even like, do you really want to knock their chance of success down to thirty percent? Like it's it's silly. So um, the next issue I see that the trainers make, and they're like they're super well meaning. Um, or they're egomaniacs, <laughs> like, like they're really well-meaning and they're trying to like do it for them or they're like sure that they know better than the clients is when the, the trainer actually Goldilocks is the habit for the client, which is, um, is silly for two reasons. Number one, it's directive instead of guiding. And we know that, that directing as a coaching style for stuff outside the gym just isn't very effective. Like the more we tell people what to do and the less they get to have a, have a, a, a plan and create, having a say in creating the plan with us, um, we're, we're changing the dynamic a lot in a way that is less motivating, right? If we create the plan with them, they motivate themselves. So we want them to Goldilocks to have it for us. That's the first reason it's silly for us to do it for them. The second reason is <clears throat> that they actually know better than we do. Right, like we talk to them, we know a lot about their lives, we know a lot about their schedule, except we, except we don't, except for all the things that they don't tell us and all the things that, that we don't have like a perfect picture of. If my clients get in the habit of Goldilocks and habits for themselves, they'll let me know when their parents are in town or when they've got a big work project or whatever, and they actually need to Goldilocks it down, not because of their skill level, but because their life just doesn't support it right then. And that's super cool. That is so freaking money for having people stay in the game at times that they would normally drop out. That, that, that might be like worth the price of admission right there. Because when my client, like I might have a client that's like, this next week is completely crushing. I'm going to work on eating slower at three meals this week. And they might have done 10 meals the week before. But by virtue of the fact that they can stay in the game and practice the habit and still feel like they're making progress, they stay in it. They might not get amazing results that week, but they don't feel like they fell off and have to get back on, you know? So that's super huge, super, super, super huge. Cause people like things change, like people have people, like people's schedules ebb and flow. And so when they Goldilocks it for us, um, it, it just, they handle all of that for us. It's rad. And so then the problems that the clients give us are they always want to take on too many habits because they're, quote, so motivated. Um, they always want to take on habits above the scale and frequency of their current level because they're so motivated. And because it's, it's a normal human bias, people, people underestimate and people overestimate their skill level and they underestimate how hard a food habit's going to be if they've never taken it on before. And so if you just know that ahead of time, you, we, can, we can modify that. And then, um, and then the last thing is, is that we have to deal with their pushback and we're absolutely going to handle that later because that's, that's like the thing. That's like the thing with Goldilocksing is clients being like, no, really, I can do 12 habits every meal this week. So slide. Um, Another thing to think about Goldilocksing is, and this is another reason why, oh, for people who have read my book, in, my, in the book I talk about having people do habits for a week at a time, or one-on-one um, -on -one I'd have them do it for as long as it makes sense, which is usually two to four weeks. At this point, I don't have anyone do a habit for, for less than two weeks. I really want that second week to, if, they've, if they overshot and over Goldilocks, I want to be able to scale it back and have them get a win, or if they skate, or if they Goldilocks it right and they like crushed it, I want to give them a chance to Goldilocks it up. You know, if if they took on you know dinners last week and killed it, I want to be able to take on dinners and lunches or or whatever. But that second week is is super rad for adjusting the plan a second time. Slide, slide. So okay. Um,
man, I'm, I'm blanking on, is it, is, it, is it Interventions where Dan talks about red, yellow, and green lights? Um, um, it could be. I've not read it for quite a while. So is that an Intervention know. or Never Let Go? It, it wasn't Never Let Go. It, it, um, so, so, so anyway, um, I'm, I'm pretty sure it was Interventions, but they all kind of blur together, right? It's all just this like giant mass of like Dan John library wisdom, knowledge. Um, but one of the things that he did in there that was super rad was he took the idea of red light, yellow light, and green light from the, uh, from the FMS, and he applied it to people's life stress. And holy effing wow, have I taken that and run with that for food habits. It is so useful because it, it, it isn't just like a framework for thinking about it. Um, well, it, it, it is. It's a framework for thinking about it that becomes a, a part of the conversation with your clients, like a regular part, and it actually gives them permission to say, this, this week up next, <laughs> that'll be some swings. <laughs> Thank you. I see, I saw that. Yeah, it's like, oh, damn it. <laughs> um, and um, it gives people permission to be real about their schedule. Because that's another thing is clients are so unrealistic about their schedule most of the time. So if you let them know, okay, like a green light's like everything's great in their, in their relationships, everything's great at work, everything's great like financially, everything, like everything's going great, let's, let's rock, right? Yellow light's like things are pretty stressful temporarily or there's, you know, or there's some drama in the relationships or there's something at work that's a lot, you know? And then red light's like um, the parents die or you're getting a divorce or um, you know, your house burns down or like, like something really bad happens. And, and, and so by giving people this, this framework to say like, like my clients can actually say, you know, I'm in a red light. Um, can I drop out completely for two weeks and come back? I'm like, yeah. What's the day of coming back? Or they can say, you know what? I'm in a red light. Can I just go down to eating slowly like three meals this week? And I'll be like, yeah. Or they can say, I'm in a yellow light. Normally, I would take this habit on at like 15 meals a week, but I'm going to take it on at 10 meals a week because I'm, I'm in a yellow, you know? And, and they can start talking about it like that. It gets them thinking about like, what does my life actually look like right now? Am I being totally unrealistic about my, about my process goals and my outcome goals for this upcoming week? And, and, and creating that framework, it, like, it's so great for them to be able to say it. It gives them permission. It gives them permission to be real with you. So, um, and it, it's freaky for them because most of them, the trainers they've had in the past have been like 100% all the time, no matter what, suck it up, don't be a puss. Um, so it, it's important that we give them permission to, you know, dial it back. So um, the other situations we Goldilocks are when food habit turns out to be harder than they originally thought or when they're totally rocking it. Um, and uh, slide. Here we go. So um, we're going to jam through these if, if you guys are willing to, uh, if you guys are willing to play. So, um, so get ready to type. If you have a client that, plan to eat for 20 minutes at 12 meals, and they actually ate for 20 minutes at 12 meals, how would you be thinking that they might go, that they might Goldilocks the habit for the next week? And you can just so, so. type in a number. Like how, like how many meals or how many minutes? What would you be thinking? So can you just say that again? Yeah, yeah. sorry. Okay, okay, so, um, so for the next, like, four slides, we're gonna look at situations. And I wanna kind of give you a window into the way that I think about, and the way that we, we train our, our trainers to think about Goldilocksing. Um, so if this client said that, like their plan was 20 minutes at 12 meals, and they actually did do 20 minutes at 12 meals, what would you be thinking? And Holly says, she'd add another meal. Perfect, that would be, that'd be like awesome, right? That's, that's what we call, Habit progressive overload. It's awesome. All right, next slide. So here we've got a client that planned to eat for 20 minutes at 12 meals, and they actually ate for 20 minutes at three meals. <laughs> what, what would you be thinking that they might? Oh, Holly, 
I, actually, I'm, I'm going to hit that app in a minute. Uh, um, Holly. Um, no, actually, I'll, I'll handle it now. So Holly said, the other thing you could do besides adding another meal is to just repeat it for another week. Hell yeah. You could totally just have them lock it in. You, know, you did great. You know, eating 12 at 12. Perfect. Let's just do it again. Awesome. So for this slide, they said they were going to do 20 at 12 meals. They actually did 20 at 3 meals. What would you be thinking to re Goldilocks it this week to have them win? How would you change the scale or how would you change the frequency? They said they were going to do 20 at 12. They did 20 at 3. There's no wrong answers. I'll, I'll make you look cool. I, I promise. <laughs> you make you everyone make... look cool. <laughs> Drop it to three meals. That's a that's a great idea, Lorraine. You're like you know what? You got three meals last week. Let's try and just do another three meals this week. Awesome. Super awesome. Lee says three is where they're at. So stick with that. Awesome. Holly says, awesome job on the three. Let's try four at 20. Awesome. Another thing, um, those are all super, super, super great. So if you look at what people are doing, they're saying like, look, they, they, um, they can do three. Three is their level. Let's try three or let's try four. So, um, so that's a super cool way to get it. Oh, Helen, Helen and Holly both said, um, or H Helen said, of the time spent at meals. You could do 25 minute meals and just do three. You could totally do that too. The other thing I might look at is I might look at doing less. You know, like if they did 20 minutes at three meals, I might say like, you know, do you want to try 10 minute meals, but try six, right? Like that's another way that you could look at it. Um, and so, uh, and so there's a lot of different ways you can look at it. It's just a matter of looking at like, like what would be progression or how can we set them up to win? And if someone, um, if someone fails to the tune of like 75%, my, my biggest concern is going to be like, how, how do we have them win this week? And so I would probably say like, let's do three meals this week. And they'll be like, no way, I've got to progress a little bit. And they'll be like, okay, let's do four, right? That's, that's how it usually goes. And if they did three, four might be totally realistic. Um, or like Helen said, they could do three again, but do 25 minute meals or, or, or whatever. But so, so let them do some little bit of progression, but not too much because they obviously took on too much the week before. Slide? Sliding. Sliding. Um, okay, Here, here's another one where it's, where it's a little bit like, like it isn't super obvious. Plan, plan to hit 110 grams of protein for five days they actually did 110 grams of protein for three days. What would you be thinking for the next week? And you guys can kind of steal what you learned on the last slide. So people are saying, Kim? <laughs> no, this, this is cool. So I, I want everyone to think through it because like it's it's hard to do on the fly with a real client in front of you in the like five to ten minutes you might have at the end of a session to actually talk about this stuff. Scale up to four days. Love it, Lee. That's that's like exactly exactly where I would go. Holly says, repeat for three days. The next two days try for hundred. I like that too. That's awesome. That's totally awesome. So so Holly's like those three days that they already rocked, let's do that again. And then let's try two extra days, but like a little bit less. I can love that. Lorraine says 110 for, she says four meals, but I think she meant four days. Um, 110 for four days or 100 for four or five. I love that. Okay, so I love, I love that you guys are playing with mixing up scale and frequency. Like what would be like a little bit less scale, but a little bit more frequency. That is so freaking rad. I love it. Okay, cool. You guys did awesome. Thank you. Slide. Slide. Uh, client plan to eat protein at five meals, actually at protein at 10 meals.
oh, and then after the sub, let's let's skip through the rest of the of the uh, question slides, and we'll okay, get okay. to um, because like it's like it's super valuable for them to be thinking through this and, and typing it in, and we're just running out of time. No problem, buddy. No problem. I'm sure everybody's, everybody's getting, getting some, some great kind great. of ideas from this anyway. Boo, there's a delay in the UK. <laughs> I mean, maybe that's what it is. Maybe just going across the pond. We're getting like a delay. Um, so, wow, now they're all flooding in. Oh, you guys are great. Um, Lorraine says go for 11 or 12. Awesome. Lee says increase to 12. Holly says give them a gram goal for five deals. Oh, man, look at you guys. Ah, um, Thomas says, small question. If you did the scaling down on a too regular basis, would, oh, okay. So l let, me, let me get to that in a second. So, um, so uh, Lorraine and, and Lee both went for like, okay, great. You killed 10 meals. What's like an extra, what's like an extra meal or two that we could do for next week? Awesome. Let's just bump up the frequency. They're rocking. Holly goes with scale. Scale goes, um, Holly goes like, let's give them a gram goal. Let's scale it up. Let's give them like a more intense version of that for the same number uh, for oh for the original number. Oh man, I love that again. Like mixing up scale and frequency, so that's super 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 rad. I love um, I love uh, uh, I, I love that you guys are looking through like different ways of approaching this, and I want you guys to get that all the answers you said are right. The um, the and so if you're looking at like, how would I choose between those? That's really easy. You would let the client choose. <laughs> so, um, so if the client chooses, then, then you're rocking. Uh, oh, Helen says change, change gram to sizes. The number crunching may be putting them off. I so freaking love that because um, some clients will respond really well to numbers and other clients will respond a lot better to portion sizes. So that's super freaking great. I love that. Um, Thomas says, small question. If you do the scaling down on a too regular basis, wouldn't the client end up thinking, ah, I don't have to try that hard this time? Um, let me see if I get what you're saying. I think, um, I think maybe what he's trying to say is, you know, if, um, if as a coach, and you keep coming to me, Josh, and saying, oh, I didn't do what you did, what you told me to, Seb, but I did it for two days, or I did... 70 grams instead of 100 grams and if i'm like okay well let's stick to 70 for now let's do two or three days if i keep if i keep letting you i'm going to use in brackets getting away with doing less than what we originally agreed i think what tom is asking would that put into their mind oh well i don't actually need to do what he's saying because he'll always be happy with what little bits i've done ah you know what not in real life not not with real humans the um so so the 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 school of thought that I study is self determination theory, and there's about thirty years of research, basically inside of providing evidence, it, like in, like inside of this like evidence based theory of motivation that people want to grow and they want to get better, like humans inherently want to grow and they want to get better, and it's one of those things where like if you treat them like they're smart, motivated, competent. Um, effective adults, they'll act like it. If you act like they're always trying to get off the hook, they'll act like it, right? So it's one of those things where I let them know that I'm going to guide them and I'm going to help them stack wins and we can just keep stacking wins until they hit their goal. And they're like, sweet. And I, like, by, by treating them like, like they want to hit their goals and their goals matter to them, by treating them like they want to grow and work on skills and get better, they absolutely act like that. They they never slack off, and um, it, it's one of those things where usually, if someone is slacking, it's kind of like with deadlifts. It's not that they're uh, lazy; it's that they're scared, right? So you get like the brand new client. And you have them deadlift 20 pounds and they're like super scared of it because they've never done anything other than like five pound curls. And once they started to build some safety at it and maybe the first month you work up from 20 pounds to 30 pounds, right? 
then all of a sudden they start looking around and they see the other people in, in, in your semi-private group or deadlifting. Like they're like, Oh man, the other ladies are deadlifting like 155. And she's like, that lady's 70 and she's deadlifting 135. All of a sudden she started ask, starts asking me, she's deadlifting 30 pounds. And she goes, can I deadlift 155? Like, like Jordan or can I deadlift 200? Like, like Anne. And I'm like, I'm like, how about we go from 30 to 40? And then all of a sudden, I, like, I didn't have to push. I just had to make them feel safe and build some skills. And then all of a sudden, they're like dying to do like 10 times more. And, and so again, the, the, the theory that comes from is, is motivational, uh, motivational interviewing. Motivational interviewing is the evidence-based framework that's semi-based on self-determination theory. Self-determination theory says that if people feel safe, if they feel autonomous, if they feel related to other people and they feel competent, then they are super motivated all by themselves. And that's, that's exactly what I hang every single thing I do on. And um, so that's, that's, that's my perspective on that. That is a super great question. I am so freaking glad you asked that because that's, that's probably my favorite thing to talk about ever. So thank you so, so, so much. And, and if that didn't answer the question, if, if I took it in the wrong direction, l let me know. Just ask it again in, in a different way because um, that is one of my favorite, favorite topics. Cool. Okay. Slide. Slide. Slide all the way to a slide that says the real problem pushback. Okay. So let's just go through some of these again. And I tell you what, what I'm going to do is a little pause on each one. So you guys, if you want to watch this webinar back, then you'll be able to pause on each one of those. Okay, is it this one? Exercise, go look into situations one. Uh, actually, uh, no, that wasn't what I was looking at, but we should handle that anyway. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, um, and, and since we're running out of time, I'm, I'm just going to kind of jam through it. Um, cool. Oh, Lee mentioned there's a great book, Motivational Interviewing and Nutrition and Fitness by Don Clifford and Laura Curtis absolutely get that book it's um i haven't read it but i hear from all my friends that it's way more accessible than um than the previous books on motivational interviewing that were kind of dry um I, I love them all with all my heart but but i've heard this one's a lot better for us um because it's fitness and nutrition related so um so the next thing i, I want to talk about really quick is um is goldilocksing um them with motivational interviewing and so it's one of those things where i explained to them what frequency and scale is exactly the way i explained to you guys and then i let them tell me and by letting them tell me they get to play an active role in their plan and they get to um they they get to like they, they motivate themselves right it's the same thing as giving them habit options except um by so, okay, so, so let, me, let me back up a little bit. One-on-one, -on -one, I always give my clients options. In groups, I always give them a group habit. So my online coaching groups, they all do the same habit, one habit every two weeks, where they get to play an active part in their own plan is they get to Goldilocks the habit for, that, for themselves for that week. So that means that every week, I'm like, hey, the new habit is this. Here's why we're doing it. Here's a couple options of different ways people can scale the, like, uh, can Goldilocks the scale of the frequency. How do you want to Goldilocks the scale and the frequency this week? And so they'll actually tell me, they'll be like, oh man, eating slow is so hard. So I'm gonna, go, I'm gonna do seven minutes for eight meals, right? And someone else will be like, oh, I think I could probably do 20 minutes for 20 meals or whatever. But the, the basic concept here is they tell me. There's a little bit of um, ramping up with this where a client you get, like the very first time you ever talk to them about this, they might not get it. And you may end up talking them through it like, like with them, right? That's totally okay. So you're going to be doing a lot more directing in the beginning, like where you're kind of like, telling them maybe you should do, okay, so it sounds like maybe you should do five meals for 15 minutes or whatever. And then after they've been with you three weeks, you can start guiding and having them tell you. And then after you've had them for six months, you're actually following and they'll just show up and tell you, 
right? You're like, hey, the new habit is this. They're like, oh, sweet, I'm doing this, this, and this. Is that cool? I'm like, yeah, that's smart. Or I'm like, no, maybe that's that's not going to work. Or, or I could say, well, I've had clients that tried that before, and here was their result. Do we want to kind of rethink that? So, um, so we want to, as quickly as possible, move people into where they're creating the plan with us. They're telling us the scaling frequency. Does that, does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Cool. Uh, now jump forward to the real problem is pushback. Okay, so let's just get through here. Okay. It's going to be like five slides or more. Could it be this next one, the real problem pushback? There we go. Yeah. So the big thing with um, – with, uh, like, like I've been saying this whole time, is that people are going to push to do too much. And um, like as long as I've been doing this, people are pushing for too much. They're pushing for more than one habit. They're pushing for too much frequency. They're pushing for too much scale. So the question is, how do you handle that? We're going we're gonna to jam through, um, I think, seven scripts on, on how to deal with that. So let's jump to the first one, slide. Okay, next one. Um, oh, I also just wanted to, to mention, it's not their fault that they want to take on too much. You know, like we're the ones reading Georgie Fair and James Fell and Dan John and James Clear and Brian Wansink and Charles Duhigg and BJ Fogg and everything on self-determination theory and all the books on motivational interviewing. We're reading all the stuff that they don't read. They're reading about cleanses and elimination diets and like crazy do everything, like 12 week challenges. And like, so we have to be responsible for the fact that what we're talking about is the opposite of every single thing they've heard from every friend they've got, every TV show, every magazine article. So I just, I like, I don't want you guys to get frustrated when they give you pushback on wanting to do too much because they've been programmed for that and they're continuously getting programmed for that. We are absolutely the minority of reasonableness. So just as a context, slide. Slide. So the first thing most, most that I usually talk about is most people have heard the, uh, the idea of under-promising and over-delivering. And so I talk to my clients about that all the time. I'm like, the last thing I want you to do with these habits is over-promise and under-deliver. And I, I deliberately use the word promise because it, it adds some weight to this. Like, it's, like they're used to just throwing out like whatever the first thing that pops into their head is without really thinking through if they can do it. By using the word promise, they start to be like, oh, wait, can I really do this? And I start thinking through, like, it's okay. And I also let them know, it's okay to over-deliver. I'll have clients that promise to do six meals and do 12. That's fine. I am so fine with that. So, um, but we're looking for them to stack wins. So we always start with under-promising and over-delivering. Slide. Slide. This is the classic, like, this is like, there's nothing more classically motivational interviewing than on a scale from one to 10, how confident are you that you are sure that you can follow this habit plan? And it sounds kind of geeky and lame, and it is. So I only use this as a last resort for when people like really aren't getting it. Um, I'll ask them, like, scale one to 10, and they might say five. I'm like, okay, so what can we do to bring that up to a seven or an eight? You know, and we start getting, and they're like, oh, but I really want to do this too much thing. I'm like, but you're only a five on whether or not you can follow through. So that's a, that's a good script for if um, under promise and over deliver, it doesn't connect. Slide. Slide. Stack wins. I'm always talking about how it doesn't matter where they start with a habit. Because if we get a win on the habit plan that they came up with themselves, we can stack another win on top of that. And so I'm always talking about, like, let's stack up wins instead of failures. What do you want to promise for this week that you really think you could stack a win? Uh, slide? Slide. Cheater. Oh, man, this is another one where if people are, like, coming from I want to take on too much because I'm so motivated, you kind of have to flip the script. So something like, People try and cheat the system and take on too much, but they can't cheat their biology or their psychology, so they fail. And they repeatedly take on too much, do too much, fail, and the cycle repeats over again. Too much, fail, too much, fail, too much, fail. They're setting themselves up to fail. And so it's one of those things where you can't cheat fat loss. 
you can't cut corners and you can't cram. And we're, we're deliberately setting, like, 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 again, it's like really deliberate wording because no one wants to be a cheater. No one wants to cut corners. Uh, most people don't want to cram. And so I'm trying to like frame it inside of like, like, don't be a cheater, like take on the right amount, like what actually works in real life or what everyone else is, you know, like, um, so I'm deliberately saying, take on too much. You're a cheater. You're cutting corners. If you take on the right amount and build progressively, then you're doing the right thing. You're doing what everyone else has to do. Like I'm trying to normalize that and make the other seem like, like the idiot thing to do. Slide. Strength. Um, I like to use gym examples. Um, and, and, and I know we're, we're running late on time. Um, I'm probably going to go five minutes over if, if everyone's okay with that. Um, so I like to use the example. I like to use gym examples because people can typically relate to those better than food habit examples. So it's just like, look, dude, you couldn't come in the gym and deadlift 500 pounds just because you're super motivated. Like, why not start with 50 pounds and work up to 100 over time, then over time work up to 150, then over time work up to 200. Food habits are exactly the same. You get better by doing the right amount now and getting in the reps. And so that's usually something people can use like, oh, yeah, I don't want to deadlift 500 pounds the first time I try to keep food journal. Right? Slide. Foresight. This is another one where I'm trying to flip the script on the way people typically people typically think of taking on too much as this like really like noble hero step. And so so I always try and flip it. And I always say like it's foolhardy and short-sighted to take on too much and get crushed. It takes wisdom, discipline, and foresight to do just the right amount and be successful. Slide. Reps, there's another one where we're getting back to the same thing. In the gym, if you get in more reps of an exercise, you get better at it. It doesn't matter what way you start with. If you practice, with practice, your form gets better and you get stronger. Food habits are the same. No matter what scale of frequency you start at, you get meaningful practice and you get better. It's just about getting the reps in so you can get better. So those were the seven scripts I have. Obviously, you don't have to use them. Uh, exactly like that, but I wanted you to get an idea of different ways you can start to talk about this in a way that that makes um, makes doing the right amount, makes Goldilocksing it sound cool, and doing too much sound um, as, as stupid as it is. Um, and, and again, a lot of it's just being really cognizant of they're taking on too much because they've been told that a million times. We need to have these kinds of conversations, you might need to have the same conversation every week for two or three months. That's, that's real life. Like they've been programmed to take on too much. We need to constantly be taking on the right amount. We need to frame it in a way that it's smart and disciplined and it takes courage to do the right amount. That's it. Boom. Um, Boom. So guys, hey. Any questions you have got, send them through, send them through. We always ask a few little questions at the end. But yeah. uh, just to remind you guys, you can listen to more info from Josh on our podcast, Strength Matters Podcast, episode 29, where we do find the origins of his wonderful nickname. What is it? McLovin! McLovin! He tells a story about where <laughs> McLovin comes from. And as well as speaking about the book that he wrote, co-authored as well by Dan John, Fat Loss Happens on Monday which Thomas thankfully answered uh, Jerry's question there. Holly, thank you. You rock. No, you hey, rock. Holly, you rock. I'm, I'm seeing, and I'm seeing you in like two days, right? Holly, are you coming to San Diego? Remember, San guys? Diego? Uh, and as well as, as well, if you want to know more about Josh, you can go to his website, loosestubbornfat.com. That's it. Is that right, Josh? Yeah. That's it. So loosestubbornfat.com. Of course, you can... You can be mentored by him and Georgie Fear at the complete coaching mentors.com. Get yourselves on that and find out some more information about the great work that they are doing. I have had some um, correspondence between Josh and Georgie. I've asked them a few questions and applied it to some of the people I'm working with as well. That's some fantastic, great results. The way they put it together is just brilliant. Um, Holly, you're going to be there. Mega. We'll yeah. see you there, girl. So mega. Um, awesome. We got a thank you from Lorraine. Awesomeness. No, Meganus. Lorraine. Meganus. 
And of course, guys, if you don't have any questions, do please show your appreciation for Josh, who is flying out tomorrow to the summit, but still giving up his time to do this webinar. And just giving you a few hints, of course, as we said, this presentation, the slide presentation, is what he's given us at the summit. We've not seen it all tonight, but we have seen something that's very important, and it did get a lot of you thinking as well, which I think is great. You were sitting yeah. down, you were listening, but you were thinking as well, of course get all the way guys so um i think well nobody's asked any questions josh just in okay. case anyone wants to reach out to you how can they do that um one of the coolest places for trainers to catch us is on the habit coaching professionals facebook group george and i both uh, it's it's a facebook group for people that um are using either of our books or just food habits in general to coach their clients so it's a it's a cool place to reach us you can always hit me at josh at loosestubbornfat.com. Um, you can friend me on Facebook. You can uh, those. You can come meet me in San Diego. <laughs> Mega stuff. Oh, and just as well, guys, the book as well, it is on um, audio book version as well, isn't it? Yeah, the audio book was super fun to record. It was, it was, yeah. So audio book, Kindle, hardback. If you dig the workouts, the hardback is probably the easiest one to read. If you like audiobook, I tried my best to make it interesting. <laughs> oh, and, uh, and Dan read his part, and uh, celebrity trainer Valerie Waters actually read her, um, her forward also. So you get me, Dan, and Valerie Waters. Mega stuff. Well, we don't seem to have any questions coming in, but we are having a lot of appreciation for you, which is mega. Thanks, Thank guys. you very much, Josh. Thank you very much. So. On that note, guys, I'm going to go pack my stuff because I'm leaving in a few hours to go to SD. Um, stay tuned, guys. Of course, guys, guys. And of course, don't forget our podcast, our most recent episode with Tom Furman, The Art of War. Some feedback coming out is fantastic. Oh, all in all, guys, take care of yourselves and each other from Josh and myself. Goodbye. See ya.